members of INEP and friends who are interested in ecology. We are very delighted to have a chance to meet here for the sake of discussing and working for the sake of ecology. Especially to meet together at this, the early morning before dawn. Our teacups haven't filled up yet, and the mind is still subtle and clear. When our teacups are overflowing, we argue so loudly that it can be heard from a kilometer away. But when our teacups aren't yet overflowing, we're able to discuss, examine, and investigate things in a very subtle and deep way because the minds are, are still calm and quiet. As far as receiving new things, our minds are like a fresh sheet of paper on which nothing has been written yet. And so we can, we can receive or be open to new things. The Lord Buddha was fully awakened at about this time of the day, just before dawn. And it wouldn't be an unfair guess to, to assume that the, the great prophets of all the other religions also had their awakening at this time of day, because the mind is in a state of calm and quiet. And in terms of sending things to others or sharing, this is also a very appropriate time. This is the time of day where most flowers will, will open up in order to display their beauty. So this is a time where the mind is, is able to to express itself in a very appropriate way, with calmness, with clarity, with precision. Today I'll speak on the subject of Dhamma and ecology. The first thing we should know is that Dhamma or Dharma is the ecology of the mind 100%. This is how nature has arranged things. And it has been like this all along in a most natural way. That when we speak the mind, that the mind with Dharma, with Dhamma, is a mind that has a natural spiritual ecology because this is a mind that is fresh, beautiful, quiet, and, and joyful. In Thai, these all four words begin with a saw, so, but in English, these four basic qualities of this Dhammic ecology, freshness, beauty, calm, and joy. This, this mind is fresh because it isn't, isn't dried up or, or parched. It is beautiful because it is pure and spotless. This is Dhammic beauty, not a beauty of colors and things like that, but the beauty of purity. It's calm or peaceful because nothing is disturbing it. This mind has a deep spiritual solitude, and so nothing is disturbing or troubling it. And there is a joy or happiness which is cool. This, we should not confuse it with the hot happiness that is most popular in the world but a cool joyfulness. 
if none of the defilements of greed, anger, and delusion arise, then there is a natu this natural ecology of the mind, of Dhamma. But whenever the defilements occur, then the mind's ecology is destroyed instantaneously. These defilements are like evil spirits or evil demons, which destroy the mind's natural ecology. Even our physical bodies have a similar condition. When nothing is disturbing our bodies, they have a natural ecology of, of calm, as we've been talking about, parallel to the mind. So if nothing is harming the body, it's it's in a very natural state of peace or ecology. But with human beings, the defilements often enter in and possess the human being. And then these defilements destroy not only the mental ecology, but the physical body ecology. And then when a human being or a person is possessed by defilements, it's almost like some kind of evil demon has come in and taken over. This human being that's possessed by the defilements then ends up destroying and causing great harm in this world. And so the inner ecology has its effect on the, the outer ecology. It's kind of like, and then we end up with this state of affairs which we can see in the world, which is something like God having created human beings in order to destroy the world. It's, it's the one single defilement the, that does all the damage. This defilement which we call danha, craving or desire destroys the ecology of the mind and then then it expresses itself outwardly destroying the body ecology and then the ma material ecology around us it's just this one defilement of danha craving desire which the same defilement does both the inner and outer destruction. We ought to know this thing that we call danha correctly. We have to be very careful about the meaning of danha. Danha always means, or whether we translate it craving or desire or whatever, danha always means a foolish, stupid, desire. It's wanting, a wanting that arises out of ignorance, out of not understanding things as they are. Unfortunately, the devotees sitting around talking in all the temples always translate danha as just desire or want, and they don't discriminate between ignorant desire and what the Buddha called Sankapa or Sankapo. Sankapa is aspiration or aim, or we could call it wise, wise one. So there's an important difference here that should not be confused. Danha is always ignorant, no matter how we translate it into English. But there's another something similar, but it's wise, which we call sankapa or aspiration. Tanha, this blind desire and craving, destroys all ecology. All the ecology is destroyed by this danha. If you want, we can distinguish between the spiritual ecology, the physical ecology, and the material ecology around us. 
but all three of these aspects of the ecology are disturbed and destroyed by dhanha, by this, this foolish, blind desire. To the degree there is dhanha, to that degree the ecology is destroyed. If dhanha grows to the, the level of industry, if dhanha is very industrious and industrial, then it destroys the ecology to the extent that we can see in the world today. The first level is the physical level, by which we mean our bodies, the bodies that are in touch with, which are part of the physical material world. When there is sanha regarding our bodies, then they are disturbed and a lot of problems arise. The next or second level is that of the mind all by itself. This is just the, the natural level of mind. It's not the higher spiritual level that is of mindfulness and wisdom, but it's just the, the ordinary natural level of mind. When there's no dhanha disturbing or possessing the mind, then it is naturally pure and clear and is able to perform its duty very smoothly. The meaning of the word mind or jitta is something which causes new things. It creates new things. The mind means to, to think. So the, and thinking means creating new things, making new things. This is the, the activity, the natural activity of the mind. And when there's no dhanha, this function of the mind can happen quite smoothly, quite peacefully. There's another word, vichita, which means beautiful. This mind is beautiful and, and clear when it's not disturbed by dhanha. But this is, this is just the mind itself. This is not yet the spiritual level. The third level or system is that of the mindfulness wisdom faculty or aspects of mind. This in Thai, there was, we've called it spiritual or Tang Yan to try and show this, the distinction between the ordinary mental level. This third level, if it is free of dhanha, if the spiritual aspect of mind is free of this blind craving, then that is something very special. By this spiritual level or the level of awareness and understanding, of spiritual awareness and understanding, we're talking about one's views on the world, one's perspectives, beliefs, um, theories, and ideals regarding life in the world. If this is disturbed by dhanha, then this whole level, spiritual level, is destroyed and there's no ecology, its, it's natural ecology is, is wiped out. So this is on the last of the three levels, the spiritual level. When dhanha, when this stupid desires affect the body, when there is dhanha regarding the body, the physical material side of life, then it, it will lead to very strong desires which will be, will automatically bring danger and punishment. And now there's so much dhanha so on this physical level 
that everyone's houses are just full up with things that nobody needs. Our houses are cluttered with, with junk that we've accumulated because of this, this kind of desire. And so in getting it, in accumulating it, there's a lot of destruction taking place. Would you all please check your homes, take a good survey of your homes, and see how many things you have which are totally unnecessary. Take a look at all the things we have in our houses which we really don't need, which just clutter up and destroy the ecology of our homes. For example, we heard on the radio that there were two to Farang, to foreigners. The wife spent $400 to buy a birdcage, and so did her husband. And then they asked, why were you spending so much money on a birdcage? And they said they were going to take it home and put a light bulb inside to make some nice lampshades. So this is the kind of way we do things now. And so the ecology of our homes, our physical ecology, is consequently a mess. So please take a good look at your own home. In every newspaper, it's just full of advertisements for all kinds of things, all kinds of consumer goods. I've I've studied these newspapers very carefully and I've searched very diligently until I got dizzy looking for something worth buying. And still after all these years, I've never seen anything advertised in the newspaper that is actually worth, worth buying. But this is the result of this industrial world of ours. We've got these newspapers stirring up all kinds of desires and we've got because we've got this industrial mentality where we're creating all these things and then we have to convince people to buy them so be, and this is all run on on desire on dunha so this industriousness our industry has destroyed not only the ecology of the world, but the ecology of our homes and our own bodies. This, this dunha has three, is very broad, and so it has three basic directions or ways of disturbing the mind. The first is the desire to get, to get things, to have them, especially material material things. The second is the desire to be, to become something, to be something. And then the third kind is the desire to not be, to not exist, the desire for annihilation, the desire to not become something. Because there are these three kinds of desire it has many different ways of disturbing the mind and destroying our ecology. This dhanha also disturbs the second level, the purely mental level. These are, this is what we call the nivarana, nivarana or hindrances, which they don't, they disturb the, the mind. They don't kill us or do anything like that, but they constantly keep us off balance and annoyed. These nivarana are like gnats that buzz around in our face and our eyes. They won't kill us, but they can really annoy us to the part that they make us pretty angry. So this dhanha has the same effect on the mind. It becomes all these hindrances, these Nivarana, which, which disturb and annoy us pretty much all the time. 
tanha becomes these five hindrances. The first one is desire in a sensual or a sexual direction. Here we mean just the the feeling of desire itself. We don't mean any action based on it. But just that feeling of sensuousness, sensual, sexy desire in the mind, this disturbs the mind a great deal. And then on the, the other side is the hindrance of aversion or ill will. And this, even if not acted on, just this feeling of aversion in the mind, of ill will, this negativity in the mind, is quite disturbing. Then, the, then the, there's the kind of ignorance and delusion sorts of hindrances. The first is dullness of the mind. When the mind is depressed, flat, dull, <coughs> sluggish, then there's the opposite of that, which when the mind is excited, distracted, when it's bubbly and bouncing and has a kind of out-of-control energy. And then the fifth of these is doubt, uncertainty, not knowing what is correct, not knowing what is safe, having doubts and a lot of uncertainty about life. This is called, this is the fifth of these hindrances. This is just on the mental level itself. It's, we're not talking about action out in the world. But just these kind of feelings in the mind of sensual desire, of aversion, of dullness and sluggishness, of distraction, and of uncertainty. These will, these will destroy, these will harm the mind's ecology a great deal. And these are things which are coming up all the time although many people don't recognize them or pay attention. But they're coming up and keeping and harming our mental ecology almost continuously. The positively directed hindrance of sensual desire, the negatively aimed one of aversion, these don't disturb the mind nearly as much as the, the hindrances of delusion. Of, of stupidity, especially the most disturbing of all of these is the one of, of hesitancy, of doubt, because the mind doesn't know, then it's, we're, the mind is always hesitating, it's never sure of itself, there's always this hesitancy, and then, then after a moment's hesitation there's doubt. There's, there's no clarity or understanding of what to do, of what is correct, of what is safe, of what life is about and how we should respond to life. All of this becomes subject to doubt, uncertainty, and this is tremendously disturbing for the mind. This, this is the most dangerous thing for the mind's ecology. These, all these, un this hesitancy and uncertainty. But people are so familiar with this. It's been going on for so long and we're so familiar with it, we don't even recognize it. We take it to be normal, to be natural. And so we're, most people have no clue to the degree that their minds are being disturbed by this hesitancy, uncertainty, and doubt. But in fact, it's the most disturbing thing for the mental ecology and most harmful. The uncertainty and doubt which is conscious, which we're aware of, this isn't so bad because we can cut it off, we can clear it aside. But the kinds of hesitancy and doubt and uncertainty which is semi-conscious, the kind that we're not even aware of. This is what's really dangerous because it's there practically all the time. It's constantly coming up and keeping us, keeping and harming the mind's ecology. 
there are those times when you're just sitting and all of a sudden you just kind of feel, hey, what's wrong? Why, why don't I feel good? Why, why are things kind of not quite right? It's because of this hesitancy and doubt, which is not really conscious, it's just semi-conscious. And it's, but still it's able to destroy the mental ecology. It's only the arahant, the perfected being, that has totally gotten free of this. Otherwise, the mind is being kept off balance by these doubts and uncertainties. For example, if we deposit money in the bank, and then we, we won't be able to help worrying about what will happen. What if the bank closes or goes bankrupt or something happens? And we, we have all these worries, these doubts, these uncertainties about putting money in the bank. And so they're disturbing the ecology of the mind constantly in this way. Whether, even if it's not conscious, it might be even below consciousness or semi-conscious, but still this is always there, disturbing and poking at the mind. When there are these doubts and uncertainties, then they bring on fear. And so there's all kinds of fears in people. And then the more we have material progress, the more it creates things that are frightening, things to be afraid of. And so now we live in a world of, of fear. There's all this doubt and uncertainty, there's this complex, dangerous material world we've created, much worse, much more frightening than the natural world that we started with. And so we live in a world of fear. And it's this fear is always disrupting and harming the peacefulness of the mind. Destroying, it destroys the mind's ecology much worse than the destruction on the in a way that can't even be compared to the destruction on the body, bodily or physical level. Now we come to the third level or ec the third system, ecological system. This is the spiritual level of, of the level where mindfulness and wisdom operate. This specifically is the realm of samadhiti, or right view, right understanding. Because of desire and all the things that come with desire, these destroy this level of samadhiti. So there's no right understanding, no right view, right perspective on life in the world. And when this this level of samadhiti is, is interfered with, then it will make it impossible for the other levels to, to be okay. So, and then it, we have a world where the education, all the kind of education and communication and information in this world, none of it leads to right understanding. All of it is going in a different direction. So the kind of education we have is not capable of developing right view or right understanding. And so this the spiritual ecology has, in the way things are operating in this world, has no chance of being healthy. It's always going to be disturbed and twisted by desire. And then this, in turn, makes it impossible for the other levels of ecology to be healthy and natural. So if we look honestly, we have to see that the physical ecology, the body's ecology, is not correct. The mental ecology is not correct. 
and the sp spiritual qual ecology is not correct. In that case, what's left? What are we left with when all three levels or aspects of spiritual of the of our ecology are are harm, harmed and disturbed? So, what kind of hopes can we place on ecology when it's when it's in such a state? Western the Western scientific tradition has produced one sentence which has a very deep and profound meaning. This sentence is a level, expresses a level of Dhamma, which is even, which is on the level of the deathless, which leads to deathlessness. This is the sentence or the phrase, survival of the fittest survival of the fittest, expresses a very profound Dhamma truth. But because whatever is truly fit will survive, anything that is unfit or unsuitable will not survive. But when we say this, we must be very careful to understand what is meant by fit, by suitable or proper. This has been greatly misunderstood around the world. So we must understand what it means to be fit. Here, to be fit or suitable means to be correct. And correct means correct in terms of the law of Itapajayada. Survival of the fittest means that those beings which are correct according to the natural law of conditionality, of interdependency, interrelatedness. These are the beings that will be able to truly survive. This, by the fittest, the fittest then means the middle way or the noble eightfold path which the Buddha has taught. This is, this middle way or the Noble Eightfold Path, this is what it is to be the fittest in order to survive in the most complete way. This then shows how the Buddha Dhamma is, is a science, is in fact the pinnacle of science because it it completes this discovery of Western science and shows the most profound meaning of survival of the fittest. This, the fittest, which we're talking about here, is neither positive nor negative. Nowadays, the entire world is going crazy over the positive. Everyone is deluded and hung up on the positive. And so there is no fitness. There is no fitness which is suitable for survival because we're so crazy, we're so intoxicated with the positive. Because we are insane with the positive, then we have to depend on all this industry to, to cater to this insanity, this insanity of ours. And then this industry is destroying, destroying our world. And so thus, because of our indulgence, our attachment to the positive, we're making things worse and worse and worse. So we need to, and so survival becomes more and more difficult because there, this concept of survival of the fittest is totally misunderstood. We don't have a fitness. All we have is attachment and delusion with the positive. So there's no, there's no fitness 
and so survival becomes more and more difficult. This needs to be considered quite carefully so that we can recover a fitness, a, a spiritual fitness, where there is no more delusion with the positive or the negative. Nature by itself has, has managed things quite well. It's arranged things and a natural ecology in a very good way. But we, we don't appreciate that at all. We disparage nature. We look down on it. We have no appreciation or respect for nature. And so we've tried to redo everything in our own way, according to our own desires and ignorance. And so we've messed up the ecology. Thus, there's nothing is correct anymore because it's all based in our own ignorance and desire. Nothing is correct. This suitability or fitness is, is lacking. Let me take a little time to tell you a story which illustrates an important point. In Chumpon, the province north of here, we, one of my, I visited one of my cousins up in Chumpon, and he had a, a kind of monkey, I think it's a, a langur, which is a, a black monkey with a short tail and a white patch on its throat, which is the best kind of monkey for collecting the coconuts from the palm trees. So he had this monkey, and he, he built a little platform onto a tree for the monkey to sleep. And we asked him, why, why are you so cruel to the monkey, just giving it a platform? Why don't you build a roof for it to protect it from the, the rain and wind? And my cousin said, because when I did, he laughed at me for not knowing any better. And he said, when it rained, the monkey just slept on top. It slept on top of the roof, whether it was raining or not. So this, this shows the natural ecology, how things are naturally. Then we can see how human beings are always interfering because of our attachment to the positive. How we're, we always have to add something to the natural ecology. We're never satisfied with the way things naturally are. We always have to make it more positive according to our own ignorance and desire. There's, or we can, we can look at one of our Buddhist Jataka stories. In one story, the, the Bodhisattva, the Buddha-to-be, was a a, was a, some kind of spirit or tree spirit. And there was a, there was a, a monkey and a bird. And the bird went to the monkey and was kind of criticizing him for not having a house. He said, the bird said, why don't you build a nest like we do? We have these nice nests to live in. And the monkey says, we don't need those kind of things. And to show it, he went and destroyed the bird's nest. So because the, the bird was so stupid as to go and try and tell the monkey what to do, it lost its own nest. And the bodhisattva that was listening had a good laugh by this story. So that was a matter of teaching ecology to monkeys. What we need to consider now very carefully is what is the, what is correct for the monkeys? And then what is correct for the birds? If we examine this correctly, carefully, then we'll discover what is correct for human beings. But nowadays we've, we've built these concrete monstrosities, these skyscrapers, all over the place, they're filling up the world. We need to take a very serious look and learn from nature what is correct.
I've heard, I didn't hear it from him myself, but I heard that Mahatma Gandhi has said that we ought to live as villages and not to live as cities. That it's more correct, or it is correct to live in villages and instead of all these big cities. We've gone beyond the village stage long ago. Is it, is it really possible that we could go back to village life? Are we, are we able to go back to village life? Now we've, we've not only got cities, we've got metropolises, now we've even got megalopolises spreading all over the place. So are we, are we able to go back to village life? Can we? Do we have the courage and the, the and whatever it takes? This is something we should consider very carefully because the ecology is being destroyed continuously. Whatever, we've abandoned the village life long ago and now we've taken to the city life to the social system of cities and and metrop of town cities and all these huge metropolises that we have. And so we we must be content with facing all the problems, the huge and enormous problems created by the decisions and choices that have been made. But although we've ab abandoned the village life we cannot abandon nature. We cannot abandon natural law. There's a system within nature which we cannot escape. And so even if we're stuck with our, our city way of life, with our social systems based in these huge cities, even so, we have to get to know the law of nature, the law of Itapajayata. We have to be correct in terms of this law of conditionality, interdependency, and interrelatedness. So we use the examples of the monkey and the, the bird as metaphors to help us to think about what is truly correct in terms of nature and natural law. The next question is, where are we going to get the power and authority to, to establish or to, to find a correct ecology? Where are we going to find the power to, to return the ecology to a, a proper, correct, and healthy state? Because with ordinary worldlings, if there's no power forcing them to do something, they won't do it. People even have to be forced to help themselves. If we really watch what people are doing with their lives, we see that we actually have to make them do the things that are good for them. Just like you have to make a child swallow medicine. This is the state of affairs. So this brings us to the question, where are we going to find the power or authority to bring about a good ecology? When we don't have the power of weapons, when we don't have armies to force people in that way, we have to depend on the power of understanding. We have to get together like this and speak in order to develop a proper understanding that will enable us to do what we need to do. So, and then this understanding we develop here can be taken and through the power of understanding can spread and operate in other places. So we'd like to express our, our support for this meeting together like this 
in order to develop the power of understanding so we don't have to rely on weapons. When we come to this point, then we, it makes us think of the old monarchy system or the, the government by Racha. Now, don't confuse this with tyranny, but we're speaking of the monarchy in the way it's meant to be, especially with King Ahsoka as our, our main example. Back in Ahsoka's reign, there were some, we have some records on the pillar edict that he actually made people plant trees, that he passed laws and forced different villages. He would force villages to plant mango trees, pecan trees, jackfruit trees, and things like this. So he made people plant both food trees and also trees which are beautiful to the, to the eye. So this, in the old monarchy system, was how power, political power, could be used for the sake of the ecology, even in the palace. But even so, he didn't just rely on force. There's also an attempt to talk to people and get them to understand the principles of Dhamma so that there would be, people would voluntarily do what was proper. For example, there was, he was able to limit the hunting of the aristocracy to just one peacock a day. They, instead of going around in their ordinary way, just shooting and killing, he was able to get them to limit themselves to just one animal a day, to try and teach even the aristocracy, even the royalty, to, to respect life and not to kill other animals. So even if there is some political power to enforce certain laws, it still is necessary to work to develop a, a deeper understanding so people know why and what they're doing. If we come much closer to home, we should think of Prayaratada, who was appointed by the king to manage things nearby in Ranong province, which is just northwest of here, on the Burmese border. And he would go to the villagers and tell them what to plant, how much sugar cane to plant, how much rice, how many trees, and everything, and tell them what to plant. And then he'd come back later and see if they'd actually done it. And if anybody didn't do it, he had a long pipe for smoking tobacco, and he'd whack them over the head. And eventually they'd get around to doing it. Or there was one villager that had a, a termite mound in, it, in his field. And around in these parts, termite mounds are considered to be special or sacred. And so the villager was making excuses. I can't dig here. I can't plant anything here. There's a termite mound. It's holy. It's sacred. And so Prayaratada climbed up on top and urinated all over the termite mound and said, it's not holy anymore. You can you can dig and plant. So this is an example, especially for the ties, of something closer to home, which we should not forget. This, but this is from the old monarchy system. Since we're telling stories, we'll tell one more. Um, once Pra Paya Ratsada was in a meeting with various local officials, and then a the telegraph man came with a telegram and gave it to him, except Paya Ratsada can't read, couldn't read Thai, so he was holding it upside down. And the, the man who delivered the telegram wasn't so bright, and he said, it's upside down, sir, it's upside down. And then he, he just took his pipe and whacked him over the head and said, I know what I'm doing. 
I can read. This is an example of how he, the absoluteness, the authority of how authority had to be used to get things done. Now, where, where we're going to get authority and power like that these days, I don't know. But we still ought to consider it and try and reckon the, the value and effect of that kind of authority. And then we should be very careful these days about getting too carried away, being too excited about democracy. Because to, for the ordinary people who, if we're honest, are not very intelligent and are doing things which are not very intelligent and very dangerous. We don't just mean the villagers, we mean the ordinary people running the banks and ministries and things. But these, some, there needs to be some authority to tell these ordinary people what to do. Otherwise, nothing is going to be accomplished. And so we need to, we, we may not be, able, we're not talking about resurrecting the past, but we should reflect upon the past to see if we can learn something about the means and the way to, to develop a correctness in society and the world and in the ecology. Or another example from very close in Pumriang, about 10 kilometers from here on the ocean, which many of you will be visiting today. There's the remains, there's a memorial of an old temple building of Uposata Hall, of, for, especially for that period, of the, the a very impressive size. And it was just like the ones being built in Bangkok, but here it was being built in a place like this. Normally it takes three years to build one of these really nice, large, ornate temple buildings. But the, it was built by a government official who was in charge of the South, and he, was, he had to return to Bangkok. So before he left, he wanted to build this memorial. And he did it within three months, what usually takes three yeah. years. And you can still go there and see it, if you'd like. In fact, you ought to go take a look at it. This is another example of the what can be accomplished with absolute authority. Nowadays, we probably can't do that. Um, instead, we've, we're using democratic systems. But we should consider what has and can be accomplished by the proper use of authority. But nowadays, we're, we're, we've embraced democratic systems. And so instead of relying on that kind of power, we need to use love and mutual understanding if we're going to accomplish anything. But one should, especially when we need to consider the, the very difficult question of how to get ordinary people, especially the ones who are not very intelligent, how can we get ordinary, unintelligent, very self-centered people to do what is correct? This is a very difficult question, and we might be able to learn something from the past. So, in considering these monarchical or absolute, even dictatorial systems, one should look at it carefully. For example, in this one in Pumriang, this temple, in building it, not one person was killed. Um, before I ordained, when I was a teenager, there was still one man left from who had helped build it though the last man who had, one of, who had been punished. And on his back there were scars from three whiplashes. So the worst that had been done as a, a very few people, a few, 
but not that many. Very few had been whipped. But nobody was killed in, in the process. And so, because it was for a wat, for a, for a monastery, a lot of this was done because people were motivated by faith. <coughs> but still, it's very, it's, it's amazing that this was all done in three months instead of three years. And so it's, it was given the name Wat, its name was changed to Wat Samu Niramit. Niramit is like to, it's almost like to magically create something instead of the ordinary process. And so it was given this name because it had been built so quickly, so amazingly. And not only, and also in this person's mind, there was a, a mental e- love for ecology. In this temple, they planted trees all around the outside, and in the middle portion, they planted orange trees. And so there, it became almost an orange, orange orchard. But then they also went to the ocean and collect a lot of rocks and stones and they built in the monastery a cave and they had for sitting for sitting meditation and there was a big three meter long slab of rock to sit on and so they had this this cave this was the an example of the the love of of nature which they were trying to recreate within the monastery this was over a, a hundred years ago and then they had all kinds of flowers um, they collected different kinds of varieties of mango from all over until they had like a mango museum because they had examples of all kinds of different mango trees. And they had some jampa flowers, which are very beautiful purple flowers, which they're, they're no longer left. But when I, was, when I was a child, I was able to see them and I consider it a, a great privilege to have been able to see such beautiful flowers. And there were ganika trees and all kinds of other plants and trees and flowers all over the monastery. And so, although this person had dictatorial powers, had a very strong authority, still within their heart, there was a, a love and appreciation for ecology. They, they dug a big pond and brought some big turtles from Songkla. And when I was a boy, I would go as often as I could to watch the big turtles or tortoises. And those who were really daring would go into the water and ride on the backs of them. So this is something to consider. One should not make any, should be very careful about assumptions and say that dictators are this and ecology is that and that there's no, never the twain shall meet. One should consider that it's possible that the two can go together. And so this monastery became a paradise for children. All the children in the area would sneak off to this Wat whenever they could because it was was full of such wonders. But all of them were natural, living plants and animals. We should, so these are some of the benefits or values of an absolute authority which should not be ignored. And even if we don't have this authority for the world outside of us, we should at least consider the home and how some use of authority within the home might be of, of benefit. That in, in that even if we're not able to use any, we don't have any authority outside the home, at least in arranging our own homes and the life of our own families, we might want to give some thought to the proper use of authority. For the short time that remains, we'd like to talk about something else. We can put aside the, the idea of using force using the authority and power of force. And instead we'd like to talk about being friends, being comrades in birth 
aging, illness, and death, and how we all, as comrades in birth and death, can develop a world that is beautiful and peaceful. The employees of the Oriental Hotel in Bangkok, as well as the B. Grimm Company and some others, have been coming here regularly asking for Dhamma talks. And the basic principle we try to explain to them is to just see everyone, see everybody as comrades in birth, aging, illness, and death. Even our boss, to see the boss as just another comrade in birth, aging, illness, and death, with whom we have a cooperative to develop <coughs> a world that is full of love, compassion, and peace. And so instead of, and even our salary, to see it not as a salary or payment for services rendered, but to see it as money for living expenses, which the cooperative has given us so that we can live. And so to look at things in this way as a cooperative among comrades in birth, aging, illness, and death, this is what we should work for. This is, and so even the boss, is, we don't have to look at him as the boss, just as another person in the cooperative with somewhat different duties and responsibilities. But if we have this attitude, grounded in a genuine feeling in our hearts of being comrades, of being human beings who share, go through the same experience of birth, illness, aging, and death. This is what we try to explain to them. If we still have the attitude of being employer and employee, or the capitalists and the workers, then all we're going to be doing is arguing back and forth for the rest of eternity, and we'll never have time to deal with ecological problems and other social problems. So instead, we need to develop this attitude of a cooperative <coughs> in which all of us are working together <coughs> as genuine friends in birth and death in order to build a peaceful, just, and beautiful world. Now, it, it doesn't matter what the employer thinks. If the employer is still a little thick-headed and stupid and doesn't understand, well, don't worry about him. I am not going to be just hired labor. Let the boss think what he thinks, but I refuse to just be hired labor. Instead, I am going to function as a comrade in this great cooperative we're all going to, of uh, being comments in birth, aging, illness, and death, and we're going to work for the common good, for peace and ecology in this world. We need to appreciate and honor the cooperative system. If we look, the entire cosmos has been a cooperative all along. The, the stars and the planets are a cooperative. All of nature on this planet is a cooperative. Even our own bodies, the organs in the body, function as a cooperative. This, the cooperative system, is natural and it's been working all along. So we need to give this proper appreciation and respect. These, these systems based on the power of force, the power of money, the power of greed and fear, that's, that's one way. But nowadays, we need to appreciate the power of, of love and have a, a cooperative. So we need to respect this and bring it back so that we can have some time left over. If we work in a cooperative fashion, we will have the time and energy left to build or recreate a good ecology. The birds come and eat the, the caterpillars on the trees. 
one day they eat hundreds, thousands, we don't know how many worms. I sit here and, and watch the birds eating the caterpillars, the worm. If there weren't any of these birds, the caterpillars would eat all the leaves and the trees would all die. So for the trees to survive, we need the birds. And so just for this monastery to survive, it can only do so as a cooperative and not just of human beings. Unless we can live as a co as in a cooperative, as a cooperative, there's no way we can survive. So if we, if we actually would watch nature carefully, we would see these things much more clearly. That we need to survive, we must live as a cooperative. In about 15, 20 years ago or so, before there were any chickens here, there were a kind of, a very large kind of termite, about that big. And these are pretty ferocious things. When they bite, they draw blood immediately. And I mean, they're big and it really hurts. There's still a few up in the hills if you go walk around at night. These termites only come out at night. They come out of their holes and so that it's not po it was not possible to walk around after dark without getting bit by these termites. So the last few days you've been able to quite freely walk around at night. But in the old days you would have been chewed up by the termites. But now because of the chickens, we don't have any problem with the termites. So this is how Suan Mok, as it is, exists as a cooperative. And the cooperative includes the chickens and the dogs and many other beings as well. The cooperative of the chickens are having a little meeting right now. <laughs> These, <clears throat> these termites are still here. We're not saying that they've been all wiped out or anything. There are still some really big termite mounds <clears throat> around, a couple meters wide, a couple meters tall. But the termites don't come out so much these days. If there are people around, they'll stay much more inside. They're, they're claiming they want their attention for their valuable work. <laughs> Next, we need to <clears throat> point out the enemy of cooperatives. The enemy of the cooperatives is selfishness. In Thailand, there's been many attempts to develop cooperatives, and almost every one of them has failed because of the selfishness of the members themselves. Or in recent world history, there are many examples of cooperatives being forced on people, basically by selfishness. And none of these modern recent events are proving that selfishness destroys the cooperatives. And so we need to combat this enemy of selfishness with the awareness and genuine feeling that we are comrades, we are friends. Kin, we're kin in birth, aging, illness, and death. If we have this, this must be the basis of the cooperative, not just mutual greed. Otherwise, the selfishness will destroy the cooperative. We must have it based in the sense of being comrades in, in birth and death. We ask only for non-selfishness for unselfishness. We're not insisting that everyone be selfless. Selflessness is to be an arahant of perfected, enlightened being, and that's maybe a little too much to ask for right now. We ask only for unselfishness. If we would hurry and work, if we would quickly work for non-selfishness, then we will be able, then we will have real cooperatives. When we have associations, communities, neighborhoods of friends in birth, aging, illness, and death, then we 
will be able to do the necessary work that is challenging us today. Selfishness is the cause of all the problems in society today. Because of selfishness, we have to create drug habilitation programs. We're building more and more prisons, more and more mental institutions. We have more and more corruption, more and more pollution. And the list goes on and on and on. And it's essential that we recognize the basic cause is selfishness so that we can attack the true enemy of the world. And we attack it not with weapons, but by developing the understanding that we are all comrades. In, we are naturally all members of a cooperative, and we must function as friends in birth, aging, illness, and death. Forgive us for saying so. We, we don't mean to be coarse or crude, but unfortunately the UN organization is, has been totally unable to do, to solve any of the world's problems. It's rearranged a few problems, but it hasn't solved anything. This is because the UN is quite unfortunately merely a meeting hall for selfish people so that they can argue about their various selfish um, projects and so on. So we ask that instead of UNO or the UNO, we create or establish a Euro, U-R-O, United Religions Organization. But here we don't mean selfish religions that are just going to compete for converts or who's got the best belief system or the niftiest ceremonies or robes or something. We mean a genuine organization of people dedicated to unselfishness and developing mutual understanding and love in this world. If it's possible to have both, then we should have both the UNO and the URO. But the United Religious Organization needs to regulate and supervise the United Nations Organization. But if it's only possible to one, we ask that we, we only have the United Religions Organization. And so we should hurry to develop understanding amongst the religions. All religions originally were founded with the intention of eliminating human selfishness. This is the core of every religion. So we need to develop a mutual understanding so that all the religions can cooperate. If we can really do this, then it will become one world religion of unselfishness. There will be different methods and means but all the religions will, can harmonize as a religion of unselfishness. It's very sad that there are certain, there are some religions or some religious officials and leaders who are still selfish. So we need to reform or recreate religion so that it is purely based in unselfishness then all the religions working together unselfishly in a cooperative way can then eliminate the selfishness which is the cause of all our problems. And then all the problems that we're facing in the world, including the ecological crisis, can be solved without too much difficulty if we're able to combat selfishness effectively. And so we must make a reconciliation with God or with Dhamma, the law of nature, whichever we prefer. We need to make a reconciliation. And this is done by being unselfish. The way to reconcile ourselves with God, with the law of nature, is to live unselfishly. And then we can solve the problems facing the world we'll have God or Dhamma on our side. 
if we are able to make this reconciliation. Finally, we'd like to express our happiness that you've come here to meet for such a commendable purpose in order to solve the ecological crisis of the world. We're very happy that you have put forth your time and effort in such a meritorious way. We ask that you look very carefully to see the source, the real origin of this problem so that we are able to solve it. Please see that the, the source of the ecological problem is in selfishness so that we can find a way of ordering society so that we can reform society so that it is no longer based and run by selfishness so that we can develop a kind of social system which we can call Dhammic socialism. Socialism means everybody working for the common good and Dhamma because this must be grounded in Dhamma, in the law of nature, in natural truth. So we're very happy that you have come and hopefully we can work for this in order that there can be peace in the world. And at the very end, we'd like to thank you very much ex for being such good listeners. And we apologize for making you go through such difficulties and you must be aching a little bit. But we've been doing this for very important benefit. We've been doing this for the sake, not just of us sitting here, but we've been working to develop an understanding for the sake of humanity and for life on this planet. So we thank you for being such good listeners. Thank you very much. We wish you the best. We hope that from now on, we can all work so that there will be no more problems in the world, as well as no more problems in our own life. If we know how to do this, the two will, will go together. Thank you.